Future Hacker Life Path Future. Welcome back, everybody. This is the second episode with Jonathan Cohen for Future Hacker. I'm your host, Maria Taigi, and let's move on. So, Jonathan, we are finally covering mental health. I've been willing to do that for such a long time. It couldn't be a more relevant topic. I mean, it's always, right? But still, now what we are living today is pretty insane. So, the field of mental health has been clearly evolving over the years, and you just gave us an example when talking about your sister, right? So not only with the sophistication of the studies, this broader access to data from, you know, anywhere globally, and the access to technologies, they are allowing people to be better diagnosed, right? And have access to more decent treatments than just listening, this is just in your head, which is insane. But unfortunately, this is not available to everyone, right? So I was so shocked to read on this uh, mental health and the city website that on average, it takes 11 years from the time someone needs help until they get it. That one in five adults deals with mental health or some addiction difficulties and suicide occurs every 10 minutes, And this is something that most people are unaware because it's something that, you know, I don't know if it can be really covered by the media, but still those are really shocking data, right? So I'd love to know your view on the advancements versus the challenges in this sector. We're increasingly seeing that the statistics are, are challenging. In North America alone, life expectancy has fallen for the I think third year in a row, mostly from suicide and alcoholism, deaths, what are considered deaths of despair. And can technology solve that? I don't know. I think the diagnosis and, and the getting initial treatment for conditions is, is key. To that, there is a shortage of mental health therapists, and that is obviously a huge concern. Some people definitely need medication, while other people need to destigmatize the conversation. You know, part of the work with Lodic AI as well as the Bialik Breakdown is to destigmatize and have a conversation that having strong feelings and emotions is simply part of the human experience. There's no possible way to have just this even keel or always be happy. And also that, you know, so many of us will experience some form of traumatic event that we will need help to recover from. And then that's okay, that there's no shame in that. I believe that technology will be best at helping people understand how to be better at self-management because there's a misconception right now that, okay, I'm going to go to a mental health professional and they're going to like cure me. They're going to give you tools and techniques that will help you. But really, it is the in-between session work that is critical right now that I, I think is underserved. And some people will need medication. Other people will just need someone to talk to. But what are we doing outside of therapy sessions that can really impact us? Okay, so I'd like to cover the effects of faith in mental health and in our capacity to be resilient. The reason I'm bringing that up is that uh, usually when talking about mental health, it's very common for people to be discussing the advancements of you know, the new drugs that are coming in and how it's not a problem to be using drugs, but it's a choice and the side effects and things like that. But I, I wonder about the role of religion, especially under extreme circumstances. So uh, it, it, I don't know if you lose a child or things like that. Usually people hang on to something to, to be able to overcome somehow to keep living, right? So, you know, as you are really involved in researching and technologies, and I thought that maybe you could bring something to the table. It's a funny question because I think Maim has much more to say on this. She's a very much a person of faith and I'm less so. That being said, you know, our faith, and I think there's a difference between faith and religion. Faith often comes from religion and, you know, religion tries to address the larger aspect, like the larger questions in life and talks about meaning and purpose. 
And I think for many people, their mental health is very much tied to a sense of meaning or purpose, whether that be through religion or spirituality. My challenge with religion is that there have institutions of religion have done a lot of good and have provided a lot of benefit to people. And yet they've also done a lot of horrific things in the name of pursuing their specific brand of religion. And so, you know, you could say that some many people have been harmed who have not abided by one religion or another or, you know, the dogma of religion versus the larger purpose and meaning in life that some religions provide. So I'm pretty conflicted there. What I would say is that a larger meaning and purpose, however someone gets that, and a larger connection to a community, as long as the requirement of belonging to that community isn't attacking another community, so as long as it's not a division, then I think, you know, definitely it plays a significant role in people's mental health as it helps them make sense of horrific events, make sense of tragedy and loss, and feel connected to something greater than themselves. Having maybe having a network of support, not necessarily being within a religion or not, is something that could give people more strength to overcome, right? Well, in North America, we are in the least religious time ever. So less young people belong to a or consider themselves a part of a religion than ever before. And a lot of that is our lack of trust in institutions. In general, right? Well, whether that be medical institutions, government institutions, or religious, we, we've lost faith in, in institutions. And so is that related to the increase of anxiety and depression? I know there's a lot of conversation. Well, is it just that we're more open to talking about it? And so no one talked about it before, but everyone was, had something similar. I, I don't think that's the case. I, I do think that we are in a, you know, the first 15 to 20 years of an experiment of living with a supercomputer by our heads all the time, that we are less connected to other people than ever before, even though we're digitally connected. Our friend circles are lower. There's a statistic that the government of the U.S. Uh, used to spend 3% of GDP on social and community events, whether that be parks, community centers, libraries, and now they spend 0.3%. The number of people living alone has increased drastically. In the UK, there is a they've assigned a loneliness minister to try to address the pandemic of loneliness. So we're seeing that, you know, as urbanization increases, the number of very large apartment complexes where everyone is shuttered into boxes has increased. We have less and less physical contact with our friends. And we know as human beings that we are pack animals, that it is our human connections that really help us mentally, emotionally, physically. And in the face of less of those, we do see an increase in mental health issues. There's so much involved, right? Thank you for your answer. It gives us a lot to think about, really. <laughs> okay, now now a very future hacker question for you that I can't avoid asking. Thinking about, you know, 20, 30 years from now. Well, you are in futurism, so, you know, it's something that it's probably part of your life already. So how do you think the future of the healthcare specifically system will look like? What type of innovations could completely change the way that we are currently being treated? I, I think more and more, we're going to have more information about our health and well-being. For the most part, people like, they don't know their blood work levels. They don't know their mineral deficiencies or their, you know, organ function. More and more people are going to have access to blood work, testing, medical systems at home. You know, the idea that we're bringing more technology into the home to test for and to monitor medical conditions is going to continue, at least on the current trajectory. Now, of course, there are alternative futures where we, you know, have a technological revolution and, you know, we, we revolt against technology and, and we go back to a more tribalist existence. But, I, you know, if we're following the current trajectory More intelligence is going to come out of the phone and be embedded into the world around us. You know, there are already smart mirrors. There are already ways to test your digestion through blowing into a device to see if you're processing your food and you're getting nutrients from your food. Could we move into a, an area where homes are retrofitted to have smart toilets to understand our digestion? Could we then be working on customized supplementation 
as we better understand the human genome and where you know could each person have individualized genetic understanding and then be having personalized food and medicine based on that probably is there increase in understanding how we're sleeping and how our emotional components are or our emotional landscape is impacting both our sleep and our performance and our recovery that's already starting with you know s- smart devices like aura and whoop and there are pads that you can put on your bed will that be democratized to everyone in the next 20 years I don't know that that's the priority versus making sure that we can survive on the planet and come up with alternative fuel sources and make sure that everyone can eat and that we can work together as a global society to make sure viruses aren't destroying us. But the technology exists and, you know, the quote that I think every futurist has had to use at some point is that the future is here it's just not evenly distributed is likely very true. and we have to see which of these technologies will will go forward the one piece i'll add to this is that you know we are an aging society for the most part in most uh, places in the world japan for example and china they're not replacing the number of people that are growing old fast enough and so we don't have enough doctors we don't have enough nurses our medical s- infrastructure is not advanced enough or robust enough to handle the number of people who are going to get old in the next 15 to 20 years. And so more and more of that care will have to happen at home and that's propelling this level of innovation to help solve for that. And uh in this future you're drawing basically you're completely redesigning the way that doctors will function as well, right? I mean, this is already changing today. You know, you we have Dr. Google here, but you know, which is not good enough. Uh, basically anything that you search here you probably have cancer right it's like it's all your freaking people it's, it's every every single thing you have cancer so but still having access to these technologies the role of the doctor is going to be completely different as well right i mean if you don't have the technology at home maybe it's at your local pharmacy where you go in and you can do a full body scan and then that gets sent to your internist or your general practitioner and then they're able to identify pre-cancerous states, cancerous states and then send you, you know, the latest drugs at home to monitor your condition and have targeted treatment. I'm not a cancer specialist. I I know that, you know, futurists can tend to paint everything with a large brush. I'm definitely not a traditional futurist and that I, I don't have tr- I don't have actual training. I haven't spent time in school specifically, but as a storyteller and as a writer and as a dreamer, I've seen how I've painted pictures of how things can be in the world and I've seen how technology can be scaled and so I use those skills to say in this version of reality because there are multiple futures it depends on which one we create together there is a huge opportunity to have better care more preventive care and have it built into our society at large And you know this is was actually going to be my next question to you. So being a futurist. So we've been talking to so many futurists here and and I don't think there's such thing of of being an education for that. Almost everybody that we talk to it happens, it just happens, right? Uh they do have some things in common of of you know this interest and access to technology is usually one of those. and the side of either the storytelling and the creativity so you have some some common grounds between them but there are so many different approaches when it comes to future studies so i've heard about prototyping there is the ones more focused on the sci-fi side of it and on the storytelling which is or it seems to be your case which is the this mix between creativity and the storytelling so what's usually your approach to building those future scenarios. So, I've hung out with a lot of futurists at my previous company who were like trained futurists and they have a very specific criteria that they use where they're evaluating like society's trends with a specific criteria. It's called the steep V and I forget exactly what it all stands for, but like social, political, economic, and they break down all of these different signals into weak and strong signals and the weak being that it could be an indication of something that is, you know, it's shifting and then the str- you know more forward signals are something that clearly has changed. For example, the increase of digital medicine during the pandemic is clearly something that has changed significantly. 
in each of the people that I know who do this type of work professionally, they all, you know, would say that there is not just one future and they model multiple futures based on what signals will continue to be adopted and change. And that I think is the best way because it's presumptive to say that any one technology is going to fully take over or will fully materialize. So by doing a uh, modeling based on versions of what's possible, I think we get a much more accurate picture. And then for me, what I like to do based on that is get into the specific characters and use cases. So based on this set of criteria where this happens and this president changes and we lose faith in religion, then there's an opportunity to provide X and how would X look? And that's really the area that I like to play in. And then I focus from there. So my role really is working with other really smart people who can build the models of potential worlds and then allow me to play within them. Got it. You see, there's so many styles out there, right? Let's talk about an even further future. Do you consider yourself an optimist and that we are headed to this more inclusive and sustainable society? The, the term that I learned, talking to futurists, you have the solar punk and the cyberpunk side of that, right? Or, or you think we're headed to a darker path and that we definitely need to change our ways, you know, sooner rather than later? I think I fall somewhere in the middle. On one hand, I do see positive change. It's probably the safest time to exist in the world There's the more food on the planet likely than ever before. There are more resources available for the most number of people. On the flip side of that, we're facing some fairly existential problems that require humans to work together across geopolitical lines and national lines. And we've proven to be really, really bad at that. And so when facing global problems from a nationalistic perspective, I haven't seen us have much success And so my concern is that, will we be able to figure out how to overcome one of the great weaknesses in humanity, which is our inability to work together as a global species? And I, I don't have a huge amount of faith in that, unfortunately. I would like to have more. <laughs> yeah, well, at least if we see that earlier happenings, right, it's not really encouraging. But that's why we need those type of discussions, right? We do. But yet there's still so many people who are like, well, they're not us. And this separation between us and them, no matter who the them is, is one of our fundamental flaws as a species, in my opinion. Okay, Jonathan, so uh, unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our episode. It was so lovely talking to you. I feel that I could just, you know, get some coffee here and keep talking. Is there anything, do you have any final words? You're a podcaster, right? So you, if you have... Any tips to the future hackers out there that are listening to you? What would you like to tell them? Okay, a couple of things. One is, uh, number one, I think that future hackers is great and that, you know, it's future creators as much as hacking. How are we going to identify the futures that we want and create them? So I think these are really important conversations. I want to encourage anyone who's listening to uh, find the Lodic AI Instagram page and follow us. We're trying to promote really positive content. Find the podcast, My and Bialik's Breakdown on YouTube or Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Check out the Lodic website. We have a blog, Lodic AI forward slash stories lab or Lodic stories lab, L-O-T-I-C dot AI. And I think, you know, we need to have more conversations we, and we need to build coalitions of people who are aligned to similar missions so that it can't be us and them. It's all us. We're all together in this strange journey of being on the planet. So let's do it in the best way we can. I absolutely love that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future. Future.